Hello, and welcome to the 2-Bit Game Club. I'm your host, Liam Gallagher. On this episode of our Banjo-Kazooie Let's Play, number 5, we are playing in Clanker's Cavern. But we just finished Clanker's Cavern, so we're going to be leaving soon. So, what is the 2-Bit Game Club, you might ask? The 2-Bit Game Club is a group of video gamers who pick a video game to play through together once a month. Alright, we're going to play through the game, share our experiences and our thoughts about the game's design, its history, and its cultural context, and at the end of the month, there's a podcast hosted by myself and my co-host, Brooke Jensen, who is a game designer out in Vancouver, Canada, uh, as well as a live discussion group in Toronto, Ontario. So two cities to participate in. Um, as well, uh, you can share your thoughts on Facebook and on uh, Twitter and on the YouTube channel and whatnot at... Um, uh, 2-bit game club that's slash 2-bit game club for all things and you can get your own perspective included in the discussion right so this is not a talking heads thing where uh me and brooke tell you how you should feel about a video game uh but an opportunity for you to participate in the dialogue because here we're interested about uh learning more about games understanding them better and then uh for those of the audience who are uh involved in video games in that way to learn how to make better ones. So we're leaving Clanker's Cavern. Wow. So, here we are. We've got to move on. We're going to the video game land. We need to find, um, I guess we probably have enough Jinjos now to get to the swamp. One of the things that one of, I didn't know I was supposed to, or I don't know if you're supposed to go to Clanker's Cavern then, but I used enough jiggies to unlock um, another area of the game, uh, but then could not find it. <laughs> and so now I'm here. Um, so that's an interesting aspect of these sort of more open world exploration games, right? We're not going from zone one to zone two to zone three. Um, you know, in order with the levels being like, all right, this is the level level now. Play this level, um, like you would in a in a Mario world. Um, it's Mario world for people who don't understand the weird set of pronunciations I've made up for things. Um, but you get to actually traverse uh, an area uh, between. Uh, between levels, right? That's the, the, there's a level that connects the levels. It's like a nexus. It's a hub world. Thing. Um, teleporters. So, it's something I, I did last uh, Let's Play of this. Um, I might as well do it again, uh, just because it's funny. Um, so I'm recording this during E3 uh, 2016, um, and one of the really, one of the things that a lot of games are coming out with is talking about how fantastic and fancy their open worlds are, and how the hardware um, is finally allowing them to make open world games, uh, which is interesting because this is kind of an open world game in and of itself. Space flight for the PC back in like 82 or whatever. That's not a real number. I'm making that up. I don't actually remember when it came out. It was an open world game. Um, to a great extent, um, Act Razor, the first game that we did in the 2-Bit Game Club, was an open world game. Um, insofar, there was like... Um, a fantasy RPG style. Um, so maybe I can just like eggs through these bars. I'm able to eggs through other bars. Uh, nope. You're betraying me, Rare. You're betraying me. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess part of it comes down to what you mean when you say open world. But a lot of these games like the new Ghost Recon game is going to be an open world game and uh, Legend of Zelda uh, Breath of the Wild is going to be an open world game but it, but I guess like Zelda for the NES 
to me that was an open world game too. So I don't know. I don't know about this, guys. I think the open world games have been amongst us since the early days. Um, the big thesis of my take on um, the Act Razor game was that um, it was a demonstration of how the hardware shouldn't necessarily be a limitation. See, I just used my video game literacy. I guess we should go to the swamp. Those, those, those boots are a power. Yeah, there we go. So I know that we get that the the power of, of boots um, in. <laughs> it's a bear with a tie, like Banjo. I guess Banjo doesn't have a tie, but. Um, so this is probably a world that we probably can't get to without the power of boots. Um, yeah, interesting. You can hear some like Orientalism in the music here. The um, so, so the main the melody melody the melody instrument is switched to something like a neigh or like a schwarm or like a sort of North African reed flutey type. Uh, instrument. And the uh, courting instrument sounds a bit like a harmonium to me, which is, uh, oh no, I wasted a gold feather, which is um, sort of a keyboard instrument that you play with bellows. It's like a, like a bit of like a pump organ type situation. Uh, sort of like a pump accordion, if that makes sense. It's interesting that the we have these like unspoken designations of uh, Orientalism in our culture, where if you hear uh, a nasally sounding flute instrument like a swarm or a neigh, uh, all of a sudden you're in Egypt and there's sand blowing everywhere and there's a thousand camels. Um, where we have like a cultural shorthand for, uh, you know, people wearing turbans. Um, we'll have to see. Oh no! Come on. <laughs> Fine. Um, I wonder what the core. Like, there's probably a parallel in, like, uh, North African. Oh! oh, oh! Uh, that's probably my opportunity to get that. Say, and I just didn't know it. I'm sure there's a corollary in uh, like this fun little art etched into the wall. Yeah, good use of the textures, right? Because by doing like it's almost like a graffiti type of situation or like a mural, uh, you don't have to try to render accurately like the texture of ivy on a wall. You can do something larger, which is like make a little silly picture. And I think that's going to communicate effectively. Uh, whereas, like, the ivy mud thing that we're looking at there, I think those may be supposed to be tree trunks. Or maybe it's stone. I don't know. See, I don't even know, right? I can't even tell what's happening. Um, getting lost in the overworld is good. Uh, yeah, but I was saying, I'm sure in, like, Egypt, there's hilarious shorthands for like American culture uh, musically where there's certain motifs that just sound like uh, North American music not yet not yet I'm not gonna try that a third time okay so let's go to the swamp because uh, I think I remember how to get there and they have boots and we need boots and we need to do the swamp level eventually anyhow might as well be now Oh, the camera. Um, you know, when you don't know where to start, start anywhere. Okay, so I don't know how to get there because this is Treasure Trove Cove again. <laughs> oh boy. Okay, let's get out of here.
Yeah, so I guess in episode three of this, we were talking about like the portrayal of the feminine form in the plot uh, element of Tutti being kidnapped by Gruntilda. Um, and whether or not we could apply as much, say, like cultural weight to that portrayal as we could do, like, I don't know, like Atlas Shrugged or the Iliad or Hamlet. Um, what does it even say? The Click Clock Wood is not where we're trying to go. Hopefully by the end I will actually know where everything is and we'll just be zipping from point A to point B. Uh, so fast that we don't even appreciate the artwork that's placed in between us and our destination. Um, yeah, whether or not um, we can give the same sort of cultural weight uh, and you know, value and messaging. So there's a face up there. Does that mean we just came from there? But do big angry faces mean that that's where like, a playable world is? Let's investigate. Yeah. Yeah. Starting to think like I understand a thing or two. But I don't. Hey, you buddy. You blew up. Oh. Okay. Wow, what a good live stream, Liam. Um, yeah, so in the same way, are we, how much weight are we going to want to put into the use of, like, really vague and kind of lazy ethnic uh, colorings to create um, the scenarios for which Banjo and Kazooie will travel, right? Because on one end, like, the want to create uh, a Egyptian level is kind of natural. Um, not because uh, necessarily we hate the Egyptians. I'm pounding your eyes out. And that's worth a jiggy. Okay. At least I can get any reward from it this time. You know, separating the difference between what is like a cultural legacy of trying to create marvelous and fantastical depi depictions of the Near East or the Middle East or whatnot. Um, and what is... What is happening? So I did open up Clanker's Cavern. I'm lost and confused, guys. Um, I have no memory of any of this. Where am I? I'm so lost. <laughs> um, and what? to what element is the game just like cashing in on a cultural heritage that we have where our depictions of uh, mythical um, Far East or whatever, that would be China and Japan, uh, mythical Middle East uh, is just part of our like cultural narrative practice and that it exists independent, independent of those actual real cultures. Um, sort of in the same way that we have like a mythical past for Britain with uh, King Arthur and whatnot. And we have a mythical past for the Norse uh, and Scandinavian com countries with the Vikings and the way that they're portrayed as having very little overlap between the way that they actually were. Um, in fact, oh, that camera worked. Oh. Um, so we've already gone there to no avail. I feel like the swamp was in this direction. Um, so how much do we want to peg Banjo-Kazooie for using those elements of Orientalism? To what extent is it an expressing, expression of a racist and outdated view of that part of the world? Uh, and to what extent is it tapping into a troubled but uh, nonetheless narratively rich uh, element of... where Camera, please! Um... Um, a fiction that we have available to uh, available I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna ground the camera 
it's not allowed out of its room for the next week. Ah, uh, please. <gasps> Why do you gotta? Um, yeah, it's tough. How do you figure out in what circumstances it's okay? Oh, but we have to open it up. It's gotta be. Let's try. This game is punishing me. I don't remember where anything is. <laughs> um. Yeah. How how much are we gonna try to peg on Banjo Kazooie's shoulders as being responsible for? You know, what type of dialogue are we participating in when we're in the Banjo Kazooie dialogue? Um, I know there's boots in here. I know it, but I can't get them. Right? I'm boots. I'm bootsy. Uh, see bootsy. Um, what are we gonna hold Banjo Kazooie responsible for? Um, what kind of dialogue are we having? Are we having a serious discussion about uh, the our relationship with the Middle East and the way that we portray um, the fictitious elements of their culture and whether or not it's responsible to persistently portray that part of the world in that fashion or whether or not it's okay to have a silly game where a bear and a bird run around um, and put it through the gamut of popular storybook themes. So I know that this is not, this is not where I unlock the swamp. I'm so disappointed in myself. I don't know if you can hear that in my voice. But um, I, I feel shame. <laughs> we might as well explore where we can explore though, right? What happens if I try to, uh, disgrace this thing. Can we can we do like the British did? Apparently not. I guess the French too. Reportedly shooting cannonballs at the Sphinx. Seems like everybody had their fair share at treating Egypt poorly. Starting with the Romans. Probably not starting with the Romans, but including the Romans. Yeah, I guess, you know, Ptolemaic Egypt, right? You have the Greeks uh, after Alexander's con conquest. You know, ruling the area as non-natives. You know, like Cleopatra and whatnot. Being oh, hit the mic. That sounds great. Uh, now there's an ice world. We're so many worlds behind. I just need boot power. Oh no. So bad video games. No, ice. Why? Slippery. Um. Yes, yeah, so it is a history lesson. The Cleopatra of Cleopatra and Anthony, uh, or Anthony and Cleopatra, depending on how you want to say it, um, is a tall Meg Egyptian. So she was uh uh oh so a completely different type of boots we don't have. That's fun. Oh, we have to get down there. Jumbo. Right, so I need the speedy boots in order to get to the feather platform. Ugh. There's a mambo token up there, so we might as well dibs it. Yeah, so there's a history lesson for you about Ptolemaic Egypt. Um how that's relevant, I do not know. Um, so, I don't know if we were all willing to admit it before, but uh, I think we're willing to admit it now that I'm thoroughly lost. I guess that's sort of like an advent calendar. That's cute. I like that. Even the game is taunting me with how long it's taking me to get through this level. 
but we continue to explore because it's all we know and it's all that's available to us right now 450 the game is basically telling me I'm out of my league it's a cauldron Help me, Cauldron, please. This is like Kazooie gets some fire breath at some point. We get a Deku stick. I, oh, I guess it would have been impossible not to take inspiration from Porcarina of Time, right? Genre defining, console defining, era defining game. I suppose I can fly in there. Provided I have fly boots. Okay. Yeah, whatever. She says silly riddles. Then insult her sister. Alright, let's go, boss. So, this is Snowland. So, I think the. Uh, doorways that lead to actual zones that you can play in. 350. Uh, do have uh, fangy mouth things over them. So the game is trying to communicate with me. If only I were smart enough to understand what it's saying. If only I had the wits in order to make any sense of it. So I think I think we need a new perspective on life. I think we need to backtrack all the way to the beginning uh, and then approach it from that angle because I think the game is presenting the environment in such a way that it expects me to remember where I've been and then make use of that um, information to then make informed decisions about how to traverse the game world, which is not at all <laughs> what has happened here. I don't know where I am. I don't know where I am. Banjo, I'm so lost. Uh. So the music's good. I like the music in this game. One of the things that's tough about music is... Um, it takes a long time to analyze. It's hard to have something um, insightful and meaningful to say uh, just by hearing it alone without actually like writing it down, taking a look at what's happening, doing some studying, um, and coming up with some real insights. Because otherwise you're just like, I like how it sounds. I have an opinion. Um, which is great. Having an opinion is great. And it's good to foster and develop one, but it doesn't necessarily make for the top cut kind of interpretation that we're trying to bring to the Chubit Game Club. So even though I'm in music, music's my field, and I wish that I had more... Okay, we're all the way to the front. And I wish that I had more to say uh, about the music in the game. Oftentimes, I do not have anything. Ooh, let's get that. It just disappeared. Oh, there it is. Um, I don't have anything substantive to say about the music. Other than that, like, I like the themes or whatnot. But anybody can like the themes, right? To like the themes as human, to have something substantial to say about them is divine. Um, I hate cauliflower. Oh. Um, Alright, so we're going to go back into Gruntilda's lair. 
and we're gonna try to figure out what went wrong in life so badly that I'm being beaten by the overworld in Banjo-Kazooie. You know, it's not even like I'm getting stuck on a boss. I'm not even getting stuck on an enemy or a puzzle. I'm being stuck on the overworld. Yeah, that one's got one too. Okay. I'm learning to speak the language. The level designers have put in hints for me. Probably hoping to avoid this very thing. <laughs> you guys are gonna have to try harder next time. <laughs> I have not played Banjo Tui either. Speaking of the next time, this game did get a sequel. It was well received when it came out. Um, and as far as I know about the sequel, is it's the same game, but more. Um, this is back in the day where you can't do DLC for an N64 cartridge. So um, a lot of sequels ended up being what today would feel like map packs which is pretty cool. Okay, I feel like the last time I saw the swamp, it was through this pipe. We're not playing games at a high level right now. Um, we're just going by what, I, what I'm feeling. Um, and here we are and there's no swamp. And I feel bad. Feels bad, guys. <laughs> oh, this is brutal. The minutes keep passing. <laughs> this is just like a tidal wave of embarrassment. Where did I see the stupid swamp? I need to unlock the swamp door. <laughs> Okay, I feel like I haven't explored beyond here. I haven't seen any picture frames beyond teeth doors. I think that like the teeth door areas basically just have some theme and then the entrance to the world. Little level, yeah. Okay, so I know that I don't necessarily have to look anymore beyond teeth doorways. Try down here again. Um, yeah, so this is a real disadvantage of this type of open world, you know, hub world thing where you can lose people. People can get lost trying to find the game, right? You know, I'm here getting out the per first person view 360 scanning rooms to make sure that I haven't missed any hidden exits. I'm glad that I don't have the responsibility of providing entertainment per se with these videos because otherwise I would have I'd be having like a long hard sit down with myself after this. You know, the focus of these is to try to provide some insight on the structure. Um, and I've gone into this pipe again. Sweet lord. Um, and, you know, for better or for worse, uh, part of that includes encountering uh, the elements of the game that are less desirable, uh, that are somewhat painful to negotiate. Um, to learn from them, right? This is the thing where people talk about, um, is there a thing over here that I missed? There is. All right. I don't know if that's our answer, if that's what we needed this whole time, but, uh, it's something. We're at least <laughs> experiencing new gameplay. Um, yeah, and absolutely, you need to you need to know the masterworks and the genre-defining, history-changing um, entries to the canon um, in order to really be a well-versed expert in a medium. 
but I think that you can also learn a lot from uh, watching other people fail, and not in like a Schadenfreude of an evil human being kind of way. We're gonna drain the water, or open the grate, yay! Um, but in a way where like you can see other people make mistakes, so that you know not to repeat them, um, because this is agonizing. It'd be great if this just let me into an area that I already had access to. It was just a root. Like it was just toying with me. Oh, we found it. Z button. We did it. Oh, man. I don't have to lie when people ask me if I got anything done today now. Bubble Gloop Swamp. You know, so there's valuable lessons here. Say you want to create an open world adventure game or a, a, a game with like a hub level, a hub world. Um, this is something you should think about. This use case, this player experience, uh, is something you want to ask yourself whether or not you want to make possible in your game. You know, it's something to ask yourself about what could you do to change it, to make sure that this does not happen to a player. Because this, like, so that's Clanker's Cavern. One of the things that I don't understand is why the places where you unlock the levels are so far away from where the levels start themselves. So I theorized before that it's to differentiate itself from Mario 64, where you unlock the levels and then immediately jump into the paintings. Whereas here you unlock the paintings and then get lost for 40 minutes and then finally find the entrance to the world uh, and look dumb on a live stream. So why would you want to do that? Um, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. <sighs> We're here, though. And that's what matters. Yeah, why, why would you want to think aloud for 45 minutes and then record that? Um... I guess if you decide, okay, hey, we're not going to put the entrances of the level right on top of the place where you unlock them, like in Mario 64, then if they're like 10 feet from each other, that's kind of boring too. So you have to then come in. You have to, oh no, you have to double down on the gesture. You have to say, okay, we're going to make unlocking the levels and finding them part of the adventure. Booties. Because otherwise, it's lame. Or you're just copying Mario 64. Neither of which you really want to do. Much to be thought about. Anyhow, we finally made it to Bubble Goop Swamp. Feels good, guys. Feels good. So I think this is a great place to leave it. So the next video, we'll start clean with Bubble Goop Swamp. Um, so thanks so much for watching the 2-Bit Game Club. I've been your host, Liam Gallagher. You can find us on the web at 2-Bit Game Club. Uh, that's on Twitter or at theliamgallagher.com slash 2-Bit Game Club. We're also on Facebook and Twitch TV and How Long to Beat and all the other great things you know and love at uh, two bit game club it's the number two uh, so please uh, send in your thoughts and your ideas about the game and your criticisms for my the horrible amount of time it took me to find this horrible swamp um, you can do that on any of those platforms and I hope that you learned something I know that I did so once and for all for everybody here at the 2 Big Game Club, thanks for tuning in. I've been Liam Gallagher.